Hi, welcome. I'm Kath and this is Veg Patch Kitchen Cookery School. And in this video, we are looking at the difference between kneading your dough and using the stretch and fold method. The stretch and fold method is my favourite. That's a disclaimer straight away. It's less mess. It makes bread making really easy. It makes bread making fit really easily into your day because you can just leave it, walk away, come back to it when you're ready. Um, and it turns out dough that's great. So, but I am aware that some people love kneading and there has been a lot of discussion recently about whether or not kneading your dough and developing the, the gluten that way makes a difference to how the dough rises and improves oven spring. So I'm gonna make two doughs that are the same except for the method of gluten development. One's going to be kneaded using the slap and fold method and the other one is going to be uh, developed using the stretch and fold method. So. Let's have a look, see if there's any difference. I'll be really intrigued. Let's find out. These two have been made in exactly the same way. So we've got 500 grams of strong white flour, seven grams of fine sea salt, and a sachet, which is seven grams, of easy bake, instant, fast action yeast, and 340 grams of water. So I'm going to mix them both now, and then one I'm going to cover and leave uh, covered with a, a proving cloth just on the side whilst I knead the other one. Okay, so can you see that now? That's well mixed. There's no dry bits of flour. It's all a pretty much similar consistency. And now I'm going to let it just sit and rest and what happens as soon as you add water to flour, the proteins in there, gliadin and glutenin, start to form chains and form gluten all by themselves. So we're gonna sit, let it get fully hydrated. That flour's gonna suck that water up. Those proteins are gonna to start to form chains and they're gonna develop gluten all by themselves. And then I'm just gonna come in and do some gentle stretches and folds with this dough just to, to strengthen that gluten network and make it a little bit tighter. Okay, so that goes to one side. And this one. Okay, so can you see? That's at about a similar consistency as the one I've just mixed, except this one is now going to come out of the bowl, onto the surface. No flour is needed on the surface because I've done that weighing to make sure that I've got the consistency of the dough how I like it. Um, if I was to add flour to the surface now whilst I was kneading, then you end up with a stiffer dough um, and that's when you become in danger of ending up with a, a, a dough that's more like uh, a house brick than a lovely light loaf of bread. So this is the slap and fold method of kneading. And um, if you're wondering how I'm doing this and you want a more detailed explanation of this method, there is a video that you can watch on my YouTube channel that shows you how I do the slap and fold method. Okay, so I'm just gonna keep doing this now and it's probably going to take about 10 minutes, possibly 15 minutes of kneading this in this manner before it becomes ready to just um, let it carry on with fermenting. So I'm developing the gluten in a very different way with this dough. Okay, so it's been 10 minutes of kneading. Let's have a look at how it's doing. So if I take a small piece of it and stretch it, it should, if it's developing a good gluten network, become almost transparent before it breaks and this isn't doing that yet. So it's not there yet, so I've got to persevere and carry on kneading for a few minutes yet. So, let's have a look now. It has been 16 minutes of kneading. Let's have a look how we're doing. Can you see that's a little bit better stretching before it breaks? I can almost get it to be transparent before it starts to break. So we are getting there. The um, gluten will develop further as the dough rests. The gluten, glutenin and gliadin 
will continue to form chains and make gluten as it rests. So actually I'm quite happy now that this has developed sufficiently. I can pop it back in its bowl um, and let it get on with doing a little bit more gluten development all by itself as it ferments. I'm going to pop it back in the bowl. You could wash the bowl and oil it but again that's another additional step and then I'm going to cover it with a cloth and we're just going to let it ferment now. Now this room today is 18 degrees centigrade so a cool room so it'll need probably two hours of fermenting at least before it doubles in size. So we're just going to leave it to one side and let that one get on with it. We're going to bring our dough that we mixed earlier back and this one can you see still looking very shaggy it's just been sitting sucking up that water um, and now we're going to do our first round of stretch and fold if you want to know more about the stretch and fold method guess what i've got a video all about that too so you could check that out if you wanted to um, but what we do is we just stretch the dough up and fold it over quarter turn stretch the bit from the furthest side and fold it over quarter turn stretch and fold and we keep going like that until the dough starts to resist us so at the moment you can see when I first pulled it up it pulled up quite far and it's still pulling up quite far but then it starts to resist me so now it's really fighting back and I don't want to break the gluten I don't want to break the dough up because that sort of defeats the object of what I'm trying to do I'm trying to stretch the gluten and fold it over itself so that the gluten network rather than developing in sheets will develop like a chain link fence because I'm strengthening and introducing new bits of gliadin to new bits of gliadin new bits of gluten in to new bits of gluten in and they're making good strong chains um, you're breaking them and reforming them uh, and making that really good strong dough. So there you go, we're going to leave that now. It's going to need to rest again to carry on making gluten all by itself. Um, so I'm going to leave it for at least 10 minutes, but I tend to just come back to it when I'm ready. So it can be actually up to an hour sometimes. If I'm busy, I will come back to it an hour later and do another round of stretch and fold, particularly when it's cool like this, 18 degrees. That's perfect for just leaving it to get on with it. So the, you don't have to fit your day around the dough. The dough fits around you. You come back to it when you're ready to. So whether that's at least 10 minutes or 20 minutes or half an hour or an hour is entirely up to you. It's been half an hour since I did that first round of stretch and fold. So let's do the second. If you can see, it's nicely starting to um, get full of air. Some fermentation is going on. There's some honeycomb bubbles underneath, which is great. And we're going to pull it up and fold it over. And the second time you do the stretch and fold, you'll find that you won't need to do as many as you did that first round because the gluten's developing nicely. Can you see it's already resisting my pull here? Um, so, you know, that's, that's four stretch and folds. And really the dough doesn't need any more. I'll do one more, but it completely unnecessary. There's nowhere really to fold it to. So there you go. That's the second round of stretch and fold. So that's how easy this method is. Just gonna cover that up, leave it again to rest and relax and get on with forming gluten. Come back and do a third round of stretch and fold in at least 10 minutes, um, uh, up to probably, you know, half an hour's time. Uh, you could leave it for longer. Um, it's a really relaxing way of making dough. Let's have a look at what's happened with the kneaded dough. So this one doesn't feel as full as air as this one does. Um, it's still quite a stiff dough because it's been, it's had that long gluten development going on. So let's have a look underneath. There's some honeycomb fermentation happening, which is good to see. So yeah, let's just keep that covered up and see what it looks like again when I come back to do the third round of stretch and fold. Uh, they, then they'll both, after that, sit and ferment until lovely and airy and doubled in size. 
then I'll shape them and I'm going to shape them as tins so that we it's easier to compare how they turn out. When I do a freeform shape, um, it'll be a lot to do with the shaping as to how they turn out. So when I shape them into tins, that'll make it a more even experiment. And then um, we'll see whether or not there's a radical difference between the two um, and whether or not it is worth taking the 15 minutes to do the kneading. So it's been another half an hour. Oh, look at this lovely now. It's really beautifully airy. <clears throat> Still holding a good shape. So let's um, do another, the last round of stretch and fold. I hope you can see how lovely and airy this is now. So I'm just going to stretch and fold it over. Stretch, fold it over. Stretch and fold it over. And that's four and five is gonna be enough. So that's the third round of stretch and fold. That dough is now looking really lovely. Um, and another half an hour and it'll be ready to shape. Okay, yeah. so let's have a look at these doughs. This is the um, kneaded one. So you can see it's lovely and full of air now. And this is the one that was stretch and fold. You can see that it's got good dough strength. It's, you know, holding its shape well. So we're going to shape it for a tin. And I've got here a two pound loaf tin. So what I want to do is just shape it into a square oblong shape. Take those two top corners, like little cat ears, and fold those to the center. And the same for the bottom. Stretch out those two bottom corners like cat ears and take them to the centre. And you have something that resembles a kite shape. Then fold down that, fold down that one, pull those into the centre and keep folding down until you've got a really lovely tight loaf shape. So that's going to go in the tin, nice side up and then we'll cover it with the proving cloth and we'll leave it, and in this temperature of 18 degrees, half an hour to an hour to get ready to bake. And we will come back to these. I'll get the oven preheating and then we'll bake these off and we'll see what they look like when they're baked and when they're cooled, what they look like sliced. These loaves have now had 50, uh, 30 minutes in the oven. Really interesting experiment and I was not expecting such a vast difference. This is the kneaded loaf, okay, and I am going to pop them back in for another five minutes because they're a little pale underneath for my liking. And they're not knocking hollow yet, but I just want to show you at this point how different these loaves are. This is the stretch and fold versus the kneaded, okay? And I think you can see there's quite a substantial difference in the rise of the stretch and fold versus the kneaded one. And this one I was expecting to have better up in spring, but it hasn't actually. Um, it stayed fairly, pretty much the same size as when it went in the oven. So they're going back in for another five minutes, just to crisp up. Let's have a look what the crumb difference is between these two. So this was the kneaded dough. Slightly large holes there, generally even. Looks great. Let's try the stretch and fold. So, and more open crumb, as I was expecting. Um, you know, slightly more irregular. Um, looks fantastic. This is a sort of bread that I'm used to eating because I always use the stretch and fold method. Um, small, these holes here have been created in the shaping. Um, they're perfectly acceptable. I'm pleased with that. So let's compare. So you can see this one was the kneaded dough. This was the stretch and fold. This is more compact um, and I'm just surprised at how compact this one is, considering they are both the same um, dough exactly in the set and fermented in the same conditions exactly um, and um, baked at the same time. I'm just surprised at the height difference with the stretch and fold as opposed to the kneaded 
um, but it certainly gives you a, a lighter crumb, um, more open crumb, just slightly. I mean, that's still perfectly acceptable for sandwiches. And then if we compare them, put the bases together, you can see the height difference with the stretch and fold dough being much higher and having expanded more with fermentation and with oven spring. So there you are, compare and contrast. I am definitely going to stick with my preferred method of stretch and fold just because it turns out great bread every time with very little effort. Um, and it's been a real eye-opener for me to see the difference between the two methods. I hope this has been helpful. If it has been, please hit the like button and do hit the subscribe so that you don't miss any videos coming out of Veg Patch Kitchen Cookery School all about how to make bread the easy way.